Okay, Maggie, I think you're on and people are joining. Awesome. Okay. I'll be starting in a little while around uh, 2.20 or later, depending on how many people get on. Um, but just sit back for a little while and uh, we'll start shortly. Alrighty, we'll be starting shortly. We're just trying to um, make sure that everybody gets on. Okay, so we're going to be waiting for a little while longer just to make sure that everybody gets on. Hi, Lisa. You cannot be heard, no. Um, anybody who's joining, uh, you're muted and we cannot see you. Um, the panelists are the only people who have the um, icons and can be heard. Um, and if you want to chat or anything like that, change it from um, to all panelists to all panelists and attendees. That way everybody can see and everybody can give some input. Um, so we'll be starting fairly shortly. Uh, we're just making sure that everybody has time to log on. I was not aware, th uh, thank you for pointing that out, Peter. Um, it's good to know. Thanks for being here, Stephanie. Um, for those of you just joining us, we'll be starting shortly, um, but we're just making sure that everybody gets on. Last I checked, we had about 89 people who were willing to be here, so. Okay. We're getting close to everybody being here, but not quite yet. Alrighty. We're gonna wait one more minute and then we're gonna start. 
want to make sure that everybody's getting on and I am so sorry to all of those who you have you who have heard me say that like 10 times now but we are glad to have you Okay. Yeah, there is no sound or picture here. Um, so you cannot be seen by us. We can only be seen by you. If you're on a computer and you can't, uh, see us well or anything like that you can expand your picture up in the corner um but we cannot see you you can only see us and the people here um who you can see are our panelists um and we'll be starting very very shortly um and if you could see derek's post remember to change any of your uh texts in the chat to all panelists and attendees because that way everybody can interact with each other um, and if we cannot help, then they will. <laughs> we'll be starting very, very shortly. Derek, do you know um, about how many people are here yet? Yeah, we're at um, 77 folks, and that's been um, just the last two people um, arrived in the last minute. So I think now might be a good time to go ahead and start. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Diane. All righty. So, we are going to start um, all the panelists here. If you could um, go off mute and show your faces, that would be awesome. We're gonna do a quick check-in, um, just get everybody here. Um, and Derek, if you'd like to switch slides, that would be great. Um, so this is just our basic check-in. I'm gonna go first. So my name is Maggie Natris. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, my affiliations are with USL, which is hosting this, um, Social Justice Club at South Woodby High School, and I'm also uh, part of the organization of uh, protests in Freeland that have been going on for a little time now and have now been taken off the street. So, um, let's see here. Panelists, I'm going to just go to you, Maria, if you want to start off. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate that you've about allowed me to be part of this conversation today. It's really important. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria May Gonzalez. I go by Maria, pronouns she and her, and a professor at Antioch University in Seattle in the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program, currently president of the Washington Counseling Association, board member on Physicians for Social Responsibility, as well as an advocate for me mental health services for all, but specifically mental health that promotes liberation. Recently released a book for educators called Experiential Activities for Teaching Social Justice and Advocacy Competence in Counseling. So I've been doing this work for a long time and it's part of my soul and it's part of my lifestyle. So I'm very glad to be here today. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Susan. Hi, my name is Susan Blythe Goodman. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I organize with the Coalition of Anti-Racist Whites here in Seattle, um, and I'm also a board member of For the People. Um, and I'm a teacher. I teach for a high school re-engagement center. Um, so uh, you'll hear a little bit about um, the education system and how that relates to um, this topic today for me. Um, and I think I'm passing it back to Maggie. Yes, um, I'm going to pass it off to Annie and Claire. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Annie. I'm a sophomore at South Woodby High School. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and my affiliations, like Maggie, are with Social Justice Club, USL, and Woodby Climate Strike. Hi, my name is Claire Philp. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a freshman at South Woodby High School. My affiliations are with USL, Would Be Climate Strike, and Social Justice Club. Awesome. 
Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Derek to both check in and do a land um, acknowledgement. Thank you, Maggie. Hi, folks. My name is Derek Hoshiko. I use he, him pronouns. I organize with ForThePeople.Earth, United Student Leaders, the Whidbey Island um, Social Justice Solidarity Net that works, and a few other organizations. Um, I'm just really excited to be here and supporting um, social justice organizing on Whidbey Island and across Washington State. And the intersection with education is particularly exciting with Susan being here and um, having youth present and just sort of like how to connect the dots between the field of education and um, like actual students and their experiences. Um, and then also in the midst of the climate emergency, the COVID-19 pandemic, and um, the, what the topic of our conversation, which sure is the national protests. So um, I do wanna briefly do a land acknowledgement. Um, so um, I, um, everyone is distributed, uh, but for the, those of us that are on South Whidbey, we're on occupied Snohomish territory also known as South Whidbey Island. And um, I would like to share a poem that um, really I feel helps to ground us in, in our um, hearts and in our bodies and, and uh, get a little bit out of our heads. Um, and so the poem is called Remember by Joy Harjo um, in 1951. Um, Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sun sundown and the giving away to night. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. How you are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, Remember her voice. She knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is, remember. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Derek. Um, if you could uh, change two slides ahead because we had a slide for land acknowledgement, that'd be great. Um, one more. Perfect. So before we go straight into about USL, um, I just want to say to everyone who seems to be having a tiny bit of trouble, um, Derek is sharing his screen because we're doing a quick presentation about what we're going to be doing. Um, the video is going to be small up in the corner because of presentations, so that makes it the main part of your screen. If you have trouble with volume, we can't control that. It might be on your phone. Um, otherwise, uh, we're going to go into the check-in about USL, um, and I'm going to hand it off to Claire and Annie. So uh, this webinar is co-sponsored by United Student Leaders, the Woodby Institute, Racial Justice Learning Group, Woodby Island Social Justice Solidarity Net That Works, Calix, and Indivisible Woodby. This webinar is our rapid res response to the current racial and justice protests that have happened all across the world. We are the United Student Leaders, a coalition of students across Woodby Island working to make sure that the natural beauty we are pri privileged to live with survives through the climate crisis. We are all youth climate activists ranging from 8th to 12th grade, and we have all had experience organizing protests and calls for action. As both students and youth organizers, we are calling for effective climate action and are representing the 10th legislative district in the fight for climate justice. 
Um, Annie, would you like to go ahead and tell us why we're here today? I'm going to do a quick trigger warning first. Um, oh, okay. Derek, could you? Thank you. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, what has been going on lately, and I know that for a lot of you, this is something that you have to deal with in your everyday life. Um, so we just want to say that we acknowledge your um, everything that you have to go through, and we are sorry for that, but we're also trying to learn about it, and we're trying to figure out how we can help and how um, this has affected the lives of many people for a really long time. Um, so Annie is going to go really quick into why we're here. Jared, could you change the slide real quick? Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for going over the trigger warning. Um, this has been overwhelming for so many people and we really feel for those on the front lines of this of this protest. Um, I'm just going to read through something just to kind of go over why we are here and why we're hoping you guys are here too. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. Um, on May 25th, our country was struck once again by another act of pro police brutality and murder. George Floyd, an unarmed black man, was murdered by a white police officer in Minneapolis. Floyd was known as the gentle giant of his community and his death sparked outrage across the US and the world. We now find ourselves at a turning point. If you are here, you understand that it will take all of us to create lasting and impactful change. Many of us have asked ourselves, what can we do to support the Black Lives Matter movement? This can be a tricky question for those of us who don't regularly experience the constant subtle or sometimes overt racism that still um, permeates our country. Although we may feel deeply for our brothers and sisters, as, as a white person, it can be easy to slip into the white savior complex. I've personally noticed in recent weeks that I'm poorly educated on the topic of racism and that I often feel uncomfortable talking about it because of how little I know. I'm sure that many of you are feeling the same way. I've grown up in a predominantly white community and I often use that as an excuse to unconsciously turn away from topics of racism. Now I'm recognizing that it is up to me to reach out to people of color and listen to their stories. Being uncomfortable is part of the process and learning and trying to support those who are on the front lines of racial injustice. George Floyd's death invoked feelings of rage, sadness, and a need for change in America. Thank you all for being here today and with your open heart and a, de and a desire to further educate yourselves. Um, we are now going to move in to our next speaker, I think, or Maggie, I'll just pass it back to you. Awesome. Um, Derek, if you could switch slides real quick. Um, so this is our agenda. We've done the majority of it, um, but for the next 30 minutes, um, Maria is going to present, and then we're going to move on to Susan, um, and she's going to present what she has to say as well. Um, and then afterwards, um, depending on how much time we have, um, we'll do a quick Q&A um, about any questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask all panelists who are not going to be presenting to turn off um, both your sound and your picture. And I'm going to uh, ask Maria to step on in. And Maria, if you could make sure that your sound is on and that your picture is on. Can you see me? Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, we can see you. Okay. Sorry, I'm just, <laughs> let me go back. Okay. Shoot. Sorry. I'm having difficulty here. I apologize. Can you see that? Yeah, and yes. uh, Maria, when you hit that, we can see your screen now. So just yeah. um, present as if you were in a standard like in-person situation and we should be able to see you switch slides. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I was trying to access my notes on the side. Is not that something I can do? Do you have more than one screen? I don't get, I guess not. <laughs> okay, we'll work with what I have. <laughs> okay. All okay. Right. So I would like to share a little bit today about the history of racism in policing. Before I share, actually, I have something I was wanting to say before I do. So I'm going to talk a little bit first before I share the the presentation. And I apologize, I'm not the most tech savvy here. Um, so I want to share a little bit about who I am, a little bit about my story to explain a little bit how I got here today. Um, I identify as a Latinx female and I'm here to talk as an ally. So a little bit about my background to illuminate my passion about the importance of protesting and using our voice and stories. During the 1970s, my father protested on the streets of San Juan, Puerto Rico for independence from the United States. My father was passionate about fighting against the colonization of the island and believed Puerto Rico should be owned by no one. He believed the power of the island should be owned, the power of the people of the island should own our freedom and should not answer to any ruler. He, among many brave others, took to the streets to protest their concerns and fight for liberation. But with any movement, you will find resistance. It doesn't stop us, um, but it does challenge us. He came home often injured and beating, and it was later in life that he shared with me the stories of how he was attacked and beat up by the local police. After a multiple arrest over a period of time, he was finally given a choice. Either he was gonna to go to jail for a long time or we were gonna to have to leave Puerto Rico. This was the reason we moved from the island to the States and the reason that I have committed my life to fight for justice and liberation. So I say this because many of us have ancestral luggage in which we carry. And it is the honor for us to continue the fight of liberation on behalf of the generations before us and for the generations after us. So part of that led to my career of becoming a mental health professional and specifically looking at mental liberation when it came to working with a lot of marginalization uh, populations here in the US, but as well around the world. And my career at one point landed me in uh, working in a federal prison in the Midwest. And it was there that I started to truly understand the gravity of the criminal justice system here in the United States. And so that is what started to open my eyes and let me know just how unjust our criminal justice system truly is. Um, I'm gonna keep reading my notes. But before I dive into that, before I dive into that, because I, I wanna acknowledge especially something that was said earlier in the opening. I want to acknowledge that for many people, conversations about racism and other forms of oppression can be difficult. And yes, sometimes we avoid talking honestly about racism and other isms because we fear conflict, because we fear that we don't have the skills or the competencies to engage in these difficult conversations. We often fear messing up or sounding racist or doing something unintentionally to harm someone. And this is all very, common fears for many people. But I just want to definitely highlight by not talking about it is far more dangerous. By not speaking out, we become complicit to the system of oppression. So I wanna honor this moment today because we are here to talk about issues related to police brutality and white supremacy. And when talking about this, it takes courage and openness so I ask that we enter this conversation with an open mind and open heart, to be willing to be vulnerable and allow ourselves the experience to be uncomfortable and experience that discomfort within yourself in order to grow. Because it's through these growing pains that we understand the infinite complexities of oppression. So specifically here in the United States, I wanna share that we, may, we spent about $70 billion on the prison system here. Just to give you an idea, <laughs> just some, even just a few privatized prisons make up to $7 billion a year. We have more people in our prison system 
than any other country in the world. Any other country in the world. We have over 2.4 million people behind bars. And this, this percentage, by the way, has increased 500% over the last 30 years. So let me give you an idea. The population of Seattle is 3.4 million. <laughs> so in a, just in a few more years, we're gonna have the city of the population of Seattle behind bars. So, out of, so take that in consideration. Now we have a business of the prison system in the US and out of all the people that are in the prison system, 60% are people of color, black and brown people. One in eight black men in their 20s are locked up on any given day, any given day. Three, five, I'm sorry, 5.3 million Americans are denied their right to vote because of a history of being imprisoned. In the last past two decades, the state spent it on prisons, it has increased by six times more than they spent on higher education. This is incredible considering the needs that we have need for our education system, that we put more money into the prison system because it makes us so much money in this country. So I want to highlight that because that plays a big part into why we are here today. Plays a big part into why we say Black Lives Matter. I want to say that African Americans are incarcerated for more than five times the weight of whites. And then African American women are incarcerated twice the amount than white men, white women. Nationwide, African American children represent 32% of children who are arrested, and then 42% of children who are detained, 52% of those end up going to criminal court. And so this is, this, this is very disturbing numbers because that means black children in this country engage with the criminal justice system at a very young age and continue to be involved in the criminal justice system against the will into our adulthood. So why do we march? We march because there is a system in place that is a modern form of slavery for Blacks in America. We march because people, people have been killed by police and specifically in 2019, 1,098 people were killed across the nation. We march because black people are more likely to be killed by police than any other race in this country. We march because specifically here in Seattle, 218 people were killed by police between the years of 2013 and 2019. So this is why we march. Because there is so much that's currently happened, it's important that we learn the history of policing in the United States and understand how we got here today. So the Black Lives Movement needs to be understood in the context of historical legacy of the ill treatment of Blacks by police in the criminal justice system and the American political and social systems that we have in place. That legacy is a fact. So to understand that, to understand oppression and to understand liberation, we have to learn the history of it. So for liberation to occur, we have to understand the machine of oppression. And that, in a way, I conceptualize that at least as a mental health professional, when I look at, look at oppression, I look at things through the lens of liberation psychology. Liberation psychology really let, allows me to look at the history of what's happened for an individual to understand their historical stories of their communities and how can we engage in critical reflection to help people feel that they can creatively make sense of the world around us. And this comes from acknowledging the emotional and psychological impacts that racism, poverty, violence, war, colonization, and other forms of oppression have had on us and our communities. We also need to honor our stories by changing the social, economic, and other societal structures 
that have impacted the domination, oppression, and inequality in this country. The important thing, and this is why it's so important with Black Lives Matter, the power of our community is within the community. It is within the voices, the action, the stories, the narratives, the rights, and none of that should ever be silenced. So by marching on the streets, we are writing our future stories, and we are honoring the stories that came before us and the ones that we're currently creating. I want to talk a little bit about how did we get here in the US regarding today, regarding the style of policing, because this has been around for a long time. In the United States, the development of policing closely followed the development of policing in England, but it did change. Later in the southern states, the expansion of America, policing followed quite a different path. It was actually the genesis of the modern form of police organizations actually came from the south, which is what was actually called slave patrol. Slave patrols were people, white supremacists, who were, and this was around 1704 in the Carolinas, who had three major responsibilities. The chase down, apprehend, and return to the owners, runaway slaves, to provide a form of organized terror to deter slaves from revolting, does that sound familiar? And to maintain a form of discipline for slave workers who were subjected to summary justice, which is outside of the law, if they violated any plantation rules. So these were the first police of the South and they had rights to do this to the black people. And, and, and this continued for, many, for a very long time. This is a, a very deep historical truth in this country. And then what happened was immediately after the Civil War in 1865, these organizations then evolved to the modern Southern police departments, primarily at this point now as a way to control free slaves who are now laborers in the agricultural caste system, enforcing what we know as Jim Crow laws, which were segregation laws designated to deny free slaves um, of equal rights and access to any political system or system. And then other slave patrol created organizations that were such as the KKK to also police the control of blacks and then actually really look at the protection and interests of white people. Now, one might think that these organizations of police are something of the past, but white supremacy is very much still alive. And again, that's why we march today, because we understand that, that it is very still much alive. So ways of policing African Americans now so that we've seen more and more. One way has been that white supremacists during the protests, during the protests and here in the United States, there has been active um, what we call accelerationism, which is the idea that white supremacists should try to increase civil disorder and accelerate it. It's actually white supremacists who purposely go out to disturb protesting um, and really intentionally try to foster polarization that will tear apart current political order. This is something that we've seen in the news. This is something that we've heard about, especially now in the last two weeks. And so I wanna actually, this is where I guess I'll do some screen share. So I wanna show you um, some of the pictures of what's been, uh, of some of the people who've been involved in this. Maria, uh -huh. if you if you share your screen like the way you're sharing it now, um, can you see still see your notes? No, it's fine. I don't need it. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. So here are uh, some examples of how that has happened in these current protests. So actually, Minnesota officials are really looking out for this because they've received a lot of uh, death threats. And so you might see in the news where they have talked about how white men, white supremacists have engaged in really escalating the protest. And this is something that has happened from the civil rights time where white people really did try to interrupt uh, movements of liberation 
uh, movements where they can feel that people of color, black and brown people in this country were actually starting to have a voice. And so this type of oppression tends to really be heightened during times of a protest. So I say this because what happens is there's this narrative that um, protesters, black and brown, are destroying their own blocks and there's all this violence going on. But that's not the case. Sometimes those are the stories that the, the terrorists really truly want people to believe so they can modify the narrative. And so the narrative truly needs to be accurate to what is going on. And that is that historical racism that has been in the United States for a long time that has played a big part in how we define our current policing policies. And I wanna show a picture a little bit here of the slave away, um, runaway slave patrol badge. Does this look familiar? So this is from 1704, and this is what a current sheriff badge will look like now. That's how much deeply ingrained this is into the police uh, culture of the United States. I want to talk about um, the ways in which African Americans were policed after that. And so there's two era, there's an era after the Civil War ended that the policing continued by, by these um, individuals who went around who really tried to stop the liberation from occurring. One was through the Black Code, sometimes you call it Black Laws. And these laws were put in place that regarding conduct for African Americans. And this is where a lot of laws now are in place and they're slowly trying to get, of them, get rid of some of them out of the books, but it's amazing how people don't wanna get rid of some of these book, um, laws because they really uh, enjoy being able to have power over black bodies. But these laws really played a big part into what a lot of the little laws now that they try to say that black and brown people have committed and that will be the reason of why they might want to um, arrest us on the spot or take us down to the ground or um, try to find a way to control our physical body, which can lead to one's death. Uh, this goes back to these laws that go back to the black laws, um, as well as the Jim Crow laws. And so these two set of quote unquote laws that were put back in the day that are actually still very much lingering now play a big part in how police, and I would say not all police, I wanna just put that out there, but definitely police who have tendencies of white supremacy or colonization that don't even realize they have it, and maybe even internalized racism can play into this as well, how they have used these, um, these lingering laws, the mentality of these laws, the mentality of policing to try to stop our rights today and find ways to rationalize it. And the concern is, is that why we have to have a movement is bring attention to how these laws have played a big part into today's policing and that there needs to be more accountability and policy changes in order for true change to occur. It needs to be on a macro, meso, and micro level of change. The interesting thing is during this time of the uh, Black Codes and the Jim Crow laws though, lots of protesting occurred, lots and lots of marchings occurred, and it made a difference. It truly, makes a difference to use our voice. It truly makes a difference to go out there and say, this is wrong. And I'm gonna stand here and have you look at me so you can't ignore. I'm gonna stand here and have you listen to my story so you don't forget it. So the power of protesting, the power of creating a movement is the power of liberation in this country and one that we should not be fearful to engage in. I wanna talk about some other benefits of um, protesting. I wanna talk about how protesting also promotes solidarity. This is a, a time where there is a need of collective, collectiveness to come together in this country to talk about ways that we need to dismantle the oppressive system that has impacted all of us. When you are oppressed, I am oppressed. It looks differently, 
but we are all hurt. So we need to come together in solidarity and, and support our allies who have experienced oppression in a much different and more dangerous way than those who have privilege in this country. The other power of protesting is storytelling. So, so even the stories that are being created at this moment, even the stories that people are hearing from one another when you're out there standing by side by side, the stories that you tell each other when you go home and said, you know what, I went to this protest, I heard the speaker and oh, it was powerful, this is what I'm learning. The stories of even the generations after us that will hear about what occurred during the times of marching and, and the Black Lives Movement and how that played a big part in the story that they will get to tell. Because what it does is it causes change. So it also promotes story changing, changing our narrative, owning our narrative. We are the ones that will tell the stories so other people don't create oppressive narrative onto us. That is liberation in itself. It also holds people accountable. It's amazing how Minnesota and other states have responded to the recent deaths of black men in this country due to the protest. That power is accountability. And because there's accountability, the goal is that there will be accountability then for more and more people who kill black and brown bodies out on the streets. And accountability then with those individuals, also accountability with those who impose policies and laws that are oppressive to all of us. So the accountability is not just with the police, not just with the local, local police precinct. It needs to be also with the politicians. It needs to be with people who make the decisions that impact um, how police are trained, how they are um, not held accountable. Um, I believe it's said that the research is in the last five years of all the police, uh, of all the deaths and killings by police, maybe uh, I think it was like 4% if that uh, were held accountable police across the nation, if that. That sends a very strong message that if there's no accountability for my action, then there's a good chance I'm gonna get away with it. But now that there's accountability, that does impose a different set of beliefs within a culture that thought that they no longer had accountability. So a culture will now feel they have accountability and that will create some systemic change, but it needs to be long lasting. And for that to be long lasting, we need to have policies to keep that going. And then the most important thing about protesting and marching, it creates a movement of liberation. That's why Black Lives Matter was so powerful. It is a movement. We continue to move forward. Our advocacy might look differently, but at least we're all moving in the same direction regarding liberation. At least we're all willing to walk through a place of discomfort, of oppression, and acknowledging the systems that have held us back and willing to fight those systems in different kind of capacity, in different kind of ways. But we're willing to do it. We're willing to actually get out there and take the risk and learn, but then continue to move forward to dismantle these oppressions. And that itself is incredibly powerful if you think about it, that humans come together with compassion and love to say, I'm gonna stand by you and we're gonna do this together and we're gonna create this change together in a culture that has fought against against that, actually, a culture that has set up systems to make it incredibly hard to fight, to fight against. That's why there's power in numbers. That's why these protests are global. There's power in numbers. Historically, that has been the case over and over. The more people that protest, the more people that get involved, the more likely there will be long-lasting change by those who are in the position of privilege, where they feel like there needs to be accountability. And that's why, there's, uh, that's why there are people who are scared of these protests. That's why there are white supremacists who are scared, like these guys, because we're starting to, we're making a difference. We're making a difference. We have the world 
understanding this movement. We have the world protesting beside us and they understand that Black Lives Matter and the whole world hears that. And then, so, so be aware that if you're gonna protest and you're gonna go out there and use your voice, be thoughtful of the narrative, be thoughtful of how you use your voice, how you use your allyship, but also be thoughtful and be aware of how white supremacy has impacted the protests that are currently going on and trying to modify the narrative. And let's not fall for that. We are better than that. Let's continue to tell the stories that need to be told and not be uh, sabotaged or distracted by uh, white supremacists who are scared to let go of the power that they feel like they have. We are stronger than that. The other piece I want to talk about is how do we do carry on? What, what it, when we talk about, especially when we talk about advocacy and protesting, I think about the um, S-Quad model is what it's called. And it looks at four particular pieces. One is strength. What are your strengths and skills that you can definitely lend to the movement? What are your strengths and skills that can, you can lend to the radical change of how we do policing in this country? What are your strengths and skills that you can lend as an ally to change the criminal justice system in this country. The other one is solidarity. How do we engage, which engage with cultural humility in cultural responsive ways, especially to those who are been impacted by the policing and criminal justice system in this country? And definitely being out there right now, protesting and being part of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is a form of solidarity. But, but like with any other protest, these, you will see, we, over time, we'll see less and less protests, people get comfortable again. And the question is, how do you continue to actually be involved in the movement without necessarily having to protest on the street? What would that look like for you? How would you create your own story in relationship to this story and regarding your solidarity and continue to do the work? And strategy is another one. And I think it's great to hear of all the, the, um, the work that your organization has been doing regarding strategy and looking at, especially working with others, when you're looking at strategy, how do you organize an event? How do you organize who's gonna be part of what or how are you gonna make that happen? Uh, that's really helpful actually when you're looking at protesting, when protesting itself, coming up the Black Lives Movement, um, Black Lives Matter movement, that was strategized. There was work that, there were um, amazing leaders that are part of that. They created a system of communication. There was a lot of work that went into that. And then sustainability. This is the piece that I think people don't necessarily always focus on, but this is about uh, how do you take care of yourself and the community take care of itself so they can stay engaged with uh, liberation? How do we stay engaged with this work um, and still take care of ourselves in doing so? And how do we take care of ourselves in a collective manner in doing so, so we can continue moving forward with this liberation? We can continue moving forward with this movement. And I'll stop, I'll stop right there for the presentation because I wanna, um, do we have time, Derek, to play that little, um, clip? Yes, we do, I think. Yep. Yes, we do. My father's conversation with me was daily. My grandfather uh, talk to me as a, as, a, as a black man from Augusta, Georgia, growing up in the deep south. It's probably right. My older brother had this conversation. But then it's more of like, you know, wear a condom, do this. You know, it's like man, it's like little man lessons when a cop pulls you over. When you get pulled over, not if you get pulled over. At some point, you will get pulled over. And here is how you act as a, a young black man growing up in New York. I've had, you know, 
a few run-ins with, with the police and being completely innocent. The people pull us out of the car, throw us on the floor. It's in February, so it's like snow and slush and stuff on the ground. And knees in our back, the guns to our head. As I'm putting my hands on the, the steering wheel so uh, I don't make the uh, police nervous, I realized how nervous I was. And then I realized my children were nervous. The thing that people say is you have to talk. Large, scary black you man. You are a large, scary yeah. black man. Okay. That's a problem. And hey, that's a problem. I am not large or scary. I can't do anything with that. I'm sure. That, anyway, go ahead. It's frightening. And I'm being very light when I use the word frightening. If something goes wrong, your first line of defense, um, you know, the parents not being there, is to go to the police. If you're Caucasian. So, well, I, but I mean, yes, still, that's what you still, teach your children. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it can't work for black children, right? It doesn't mean that every police officer is inherently a bad person. But what it does mean is that the police force, that institution, does not look out for your best interests. This is unspoken code of, white, of, of racism and white supremacy that says that my life does not matter. You can put yeah. your hands up and say, and cooperate and say that I'm choking and still be killed and then there's no repercussions. It's maddening. I get so frustrated and angry um, about um, having to prepare my kids for something that, 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 um, that they're not responsible for. And these are conversations that people of other races do not have to have with their children. The conversation with him was really just, look, you're a beautiful young boy. Being an African-American is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful blessing. You have come from great people, but it's also a hard thing. In America, because of your skin color, as a black boy and as a black man, we are gonna be dealing with a lot of danger. Under no circumstance are you to talk to the police if you're arrested until I get there. Do what they say. Don't get into any arguments. Make sure your hands are out of your pockets so they can see. These are the questions you can ask. This is who to call. This is this is what happens if this bad thing thing is done. Like, please, master, don't whip me. No, it's like, excuse me, sir, what is your badge number? I'm going to film this. If you want police brutality to stop, if you want police to treat you like a human being, and you, you have to see yourself as a human being. You have every right in this world that anyone else does. What I love about you as my son is I remember when we thought about having you and you know knowing that we wanted you and watching you grow. You are the Muhammad Ali, you are the Malcolm X, you are the Martin Luther King. You are an amazing young man. And the future is yours. And I will do my best to make sure you're safe. That's it. I love you. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Maria, for speaking. Thank you. Sorry about the technical issues. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Completely fine. You did great. Um, we are going to put the link to that in the um, chat. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we are going to move on to Susan, who's going to do her presentation. Hello. Hey, sorry, go ahead, Maggie. It's fine. Just uh, panelists can mute themselves and turn their videos off. Um, all right. 
Yeah, I will go ahead and share my screen and go through my presentation. Thank you, Maria. Um, as a teacher, I always enjoy the chance where I get to be a student. I took some notes. I really like the four S's that you shared with us. So thank you for that. Um, so sharing my screen and I have a soft voice. I'm trying to remember to speak up, but um, feel free to type in the chat if I need to speak a little bit louder. Um, so the three things, I, I might have made a spelling mistake. Um, yep, I did on the first screen. <laughs> I always tell my students I make one mistake a uh, quarter and they can try to catch it, and so you all just caught it. Um, so systemic and institutional racism is the first topic that I'm going to talk about specifically related to education. Um, as a teacher, that's my area of expertise. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening on the front lines of Seattle. Um, I know the students that put together this webinar and some of you participating might be watching from outside of Seattle and you might be seeing uh, a little bit um, on the news about what's happening here. Um, so letting you know uh, what those of us inside the city are seeing. And then I'm going to spend most of my time talking about um, allyship. Um, so I'm going to start my timer and uh, get going. Um, so systemic and institutional racism, and I'm going to go over just four examples of what this looks like in education. I want to focus most of my presentation on allyship. So although there's a lot we could talk about with education, I'm going to um, start with just four small examples. Um, so many of you probably know that indigenous folks were removed from their families to be placed in government run boarding schools in the 1800s. And this was to replace um, indigenous traditional ways with the dominant American society uh, to um, essentially forced assimilation. It was a, a education was a form of colonization. Um, and so what happened was that um, children were separated from their families, which we know is wrong. And also a lot of languages were either lost or came close to being lost. So here in the Pacific North, Northwest, the Lushootse language was um, saved just barely, um, mostly thanks to Vi Hilbert. Um, and one thing that was almost lost was the traditional teaching that comes along with that language um, that's very connected and attached to the language. So one thing that um, is in Lushootse that is maybe hard to translate into English, but is the traditional storytelling that is a type of education. And so this storytelling might be a spontaneous lie that you make up in the moment, uh, or it might be an artful narrative that you spend a long time crafting. And uh, this traditional story is cumulative. So everyone in the community might tell it and retell it and remember it or forget parts of it and add new parts. Um, and so this way of learning through storytelling is much more um, engaging and democratic and participatory for the whole community. And um, what also happens is um, it's just a very creative process, right? It's not that there's one right answer. It's a, you kind of are creating the story um, as you go through that. And so this whole process was lost for a long time, um, almost lost completely um, when, you know, these boarding schools happen. So um, we still see a lot of this same dynamic in our current education system, that education happens as if it's in a vacuum and not connected to the community um, and uh, to the, um, uh, yeah, just the bigger community that the kids are growing up in. Um, and then the other way that we see systemic and institutional racism show up in our schools is with the school to prison pipeline. Um, so students of color are disproportionately suspended, expelled, and disciplined. Um, Black children constitute 18% of students, but they account for 46% of those with more than one suspension. And it gets even worse when we look at uh, students by race and disability. So one in four black children with disabilities will be suspended versus one in 11 white children with disabilities will be suspended. So the number is almost three times as high for um, a black student with a disability. And the reason why I think it's important to look um, at disabilities and race is that in Highland District Public Schools, the district where I'm a teacher, as of 2013, I was learning from some of the special education teachers that there were essentially uh, columns in their classroom to be used to put a student in if they were acting out. Um, and so a lot of teachers were not using these because they knew that this is not the way that you um, respond when someone is going through maybe some trauma and acting out in the classroom. 
But the point is that the policy was there to, from this early age, prepare students for the criminal justice system, for prison, for solitary confinement, instead of preparing them uh, for higher education and careers. Um, and then I just, sorry, want to check one thing. Okay, looks good. Uh, keep going from this slide. Um, sorry about that. And um, yeah, and so the other way that we'll see systemic and institutional racism show up in school is in the curriculum. Um, so any non-white uh, cultures that aren't part of the dominant culture show up during, we call it heroes and holidays, right? So there might be a couple days or there might be a whole month dedicated to this group that's not, uh, uh, you know, the white dominant culture. Um, but the idea is that it's not going to make its way um, information about this group, this, you know, representing this group is not going to make it into the um, curriculum throughout the whole school year. It's designated just for this month or just for these holidays. Even someone like Dr. King that shows up a lot in the curriculum, you're going to hear a very whitewashed version of his story. You're going to hear about peaceful protests and boycotts. Um, you're not going to hear about the um, Poor People's Campaign um, or about what he said about the U.S. military, right? You're going to hear um, very specific whitewashed elements of this story. Um, and then this is looking specifically at history, uh, but also math, science, literature, all of these are very um, centered around Western white ways of teaching these topics. Um, and so even in uh, districts across the country that are pushing for more ethnic studies in schools, um, a lot of times what they're being offered is to teach one class that is ethnic studies, so that lumps in all these um, non-white cultures into one class. Instead of looking at all of these different subjects and how there could be ethnic studies standards incorporated into all of them. Um, and I want to pause and give a shout out here because I saw that my coworker, um, Kayla, is uh, following along with this webinar. And she has done an amazing job at my school of um, trying to uh, uh, push the curriculum. And she created um, an indigenous science class. So um, yeah, just you know, very honored to work with her and uh, see her kind of make movements on this. And then the last thing that I want to say about education um, standardized test is a very um, uh, predominant uh, systemic and institutional racism example in schools. Um, and I need to really <laughs> not go on a rant here, so I'm going to just say um, very quickly that uh, standardized tests were created by uh, a noted white supremacist who had a white supremacist agenda, created a test to prove that whites were superior. So it was not a race neutral test at all. Um, and we, we really were able to see this when during affirmative action, students of color were given quotas in programs where they were able to enter programs that their standardized test scores wouldn't allow them to enter, but then they, they passed the exit exams in those programs as well as their white counterparts. So standardized tests do not predict success in college and professional careers. Um, they don't measure intelligence because that's not standardized, right? What standardized tests measure is the amount of opportunities you will have. And they were created, again, to benefit white people. And we still use them to allow students to graduate and to decide what um, higher education and other opportunities they have. Um, and so as a teacher who watches students struggle with standardized tests today, um, this is a very frustrating thing that is still a part of our education system. Um, and so that's the end of the education. So I also wanted to um, shout out to my friend Lily, who uh, is in the webinar and who is a teacher that um, is constantly working to dismantle all these um, oppressions in education. Um, just, you know, really honored to have uh, met a teacher like her and worked with a teacher like her. Um, so I wish I could talk a lot more about education because that is a, um, something I care about. And I know a lot of the students here probably are um, feeling like maybe some of those topics are familiar. So if you want to go into it during the question and answer, we definitely can. Um, but I also want to make sure I save time to talk to you all about what's happening right here in Seattle um, for those of you that um, aren't here. And I personally have not gone to a march yet. So what I'm reporting is what I found in my research um, and what I um, have talked to about with uh, friends who have been out there, but I have not been out there firsthand yet. So I just wanted to be really clear about that. Uh, so on Tuesday, we had a very historic moment where community organizers 
gave the mayor and police chief three clear demands. Um, to defund the police, cut their budget in half, their budget is $363 million, put that money back into community health, and then release and don't prosecute pro protesters and expedite releases of all cases possible um, to stop the spread of COVID-19 in correctional facilities. And so at the top photo, you see Nikita Oliver, who gave the mayor and the um, chief of police these demands in a private meeting that Nikita insisted uh, was live streamed so that the public could follow along. And then Nikita walked outside and everyone followed and she gave the same demands in front of the 12,000 protesters that you see in the second photo. Um, and these were presented on behalf of No New Youth Jail, Decriminalize Seattle, Block the Bunker, Seattle People's Party, COVID-19 Mutual Aid, Trans Women of Color Solidarity Network, Bayan, La Resistencia, Carisal, CID Coalition, Asians for Black Lives, and API CAG. So a lot of groups signed on to these three demands, these three clear demands. The mayor did not respond to the demands. Um, and then that same day on Tuesday, that morning, Black Lives Matter Seattle King County released a statement explaining that they have not organized any of the marches and they actually have encouraged their community to stay home because of the pandemic. And so what's really important here is to understand that Black Lives Matter is a movement and there also is a local organization called Black Lives Matter Seattle King County. And so a lot of people, including the mayor who has met with the, um, the organization leaders were um, spreading this narrative as if they had sat down and met with the organization this week um, and they had not. <laughs> and so what's important about this is that this is one example of um, racism to kind of treat any sort of movement that's made up of mostly people of color as if it's a homogenous group um, versus uh, the civil rights movement, right? If we look at history, we again, in the curriculum, we'll learn about Dr. King, Rosa Parks, peaceful boycotts and protests. Um, but there's a lot more going on, right? There were lots of diverse groups working on campaigns for racial justice. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Black Panthers, Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, the NAACP, women's political councils and other women's groups, churches, black arts movement, um, and a lot of other groups of artists. And then even some unions, of course, some unions were very racist at the time, but some were actively working for racial justice. Um, and so same, uh, you know, the same thing is going on today. Uh, the groups that handed the mayor the demands on Tuesday um, were a very diverse group of lots of different organizations. And then there also is Black Lives Matter Seattle King County. Um, and so while everyone might be working within the same movement, there are lots of different organizations um, that we, it's kind of up to, us if we're spreading the narrative of this movement to do our research and um, to make the distinction between what group is supporting what demands. So these are the Black Lives Matter Seattle King County organization demands um, and they've gotten the uh, first two that the city rescind the motion asking to end the consent decree and that the mayor ends the curfew. Um, it was ended on Wednesday. Uh, and what they ask of us is our unwavering persistence in this fight. So it's very easy uh, for um, people to lose track after a news cycle and for politicians and other people in power to just um, kind of wait for our attention span to get distracted. So we need to kind of stay in this fight and not um, lose that focus. Uh, and the other thing this organization demanded was that law enforcement turn on their body cams and leave them on, um, display their badge numbers. Um, and then they also demanded uh, de-escalation team instead of the constant escalations that were happening each night from the police and that the city council state legislature and congress all consider efforts to decrease funding for police and instead increase funding for health and social services so you can see some of these are um, similar to the demands that the other organizers made on tuesday um, but they again do have their own distinction that we want to be um, clear that we're researching and not lumping all of these different groups together so here in Seattle from Friday to Tuesday, police invited, police incited violence every single night in Seattle. Um, they, I, I'm sure everyone saw on the news how they maced an eight-year-old child on Saturday, which was very tragic to watch. Um, they've used tear gas, rubber bullets, flashbangs. Um, they've attacked journalists. Uh, the tear gas, two nights that they used the tear gas was in Capitol Hill, which is um, the historically LGBTQ neighborhood. 
Um, and this happened the first two months, or sorry, first two nights of Pride Month, which was um, pretty tragic for that community. Uh, and within that time frame, there were 14,000 complaints to the Office of Police Accountability. Um, so there was a lot that went down, and there were a lot of people that um, stood up and, um, you know, made it heard. So if you are watching information about Seattle and you're seeing a lot about riots and looters, um, I would recommend staying away from mainstream media channels and finding local Seattle sources to follow. My top recommendation is South Seattle Emerald because they are a Black-owned media company um, and because they go out of their way to make sure that their stories have a racial justice lens. And there are some other local uh, media outlets that are doing some good work too if you would like to follow them. Um, and I will say that I was driving around with my husband yesterday. He's an outreach worker. And I noticed that Amazon had some windows broken and the Ferrari dealership on Capitol Hill had their windows broken. Um, and so I invite you to maybe do some research into those uh, corporations and what their presence in Seattle has done. But I noticed that the small owned businesses right next to them um, seem to be untouched. Um, and I've only driven around once, so there might be parts of the city that I haven't seen yet. Um, but um, I think there's a different thing happening on the ground than we might be seeing in the news. So shifting gears to the last topic that I wanted to spend the most time on um, is allyship. You heard the students at the beginning say that they want to know more about the topic of racism and more about how do we show up and support people on the front lines. Um, and so that's what I want to try to spend some time on today. Um, and so I kind of wrote this phrase, allyship should be a verb, not a noun, and immediately found someone on Instagram posting it too. Uh, Waste Free Marie seems to be posting a lot of helpful advice about allyship if you want to follow them on Instagram. Um, and yeah, so basically allyship should be something that we're doing, not something that we claim to be. Other people are, are saying use the word advocate or use the word accomplice because that's more action oriented. Um, I'm not concerned about which word you choose to describe yourself as, but what you do with the word that you choose. Um, and this is a lifelong journey. So this is not a destination where you become the ally you want to be in your set. This is something we always have to educate and work on. And I think many of the adults on this webinar um, probably will back me up on that. <laughs> um, allyship tends to get better and deeper the longer that you keep trying to do it. You build more meaningful and authentic relationships, um, and it makes uh, your allyship more meaningful and authentic. So the best advice is just to keep trying at it. And I'll give you some specifics about what that can look like and um, how that can look kind of harmful at first and hopefully grows into something helpful. But again, the most important takeaway is just keep trying at it. So some harmful allyships. Um, some of the students opening the presentation talked about the white savior complex. And again, if this is something you want to dig into a lot more, um, you can follow No White Saviors on Instagram. This Instagram account is created by Ugandan women who are looking at um, white folks, a lot of missionaries that come to Uganda to save Uganda, um, as if Uganda doesn't have heroes there in Uganda already, or you know, does it even need saving, right? Um, so that this dynamic, is international and it's also happening right here in the US between um, white allies and uh, people of color organizations. Um, so yeah, the white savior complex, no white saviors um, internationally, but also pay attention to how it shows up here in our own spaces. Usually this comes from someone who has recognized that they have white privilege and might be feeling a lot of guilt and they want to you know, go out and fix the problem of racism um, but what happens is that they're promoting white supremacy by giving out the idea that they're the one that is going to fix it. They, the white people know best how to fix this problem, right? So that's why we have to be careful with that. Um, another type of allyship that can be harmful is performative allyship. So a lot of corporations were tweeting, Black Lives Matter, Blackout Tuesday this week, including the Washington Redskins. And several people immediately started pointing out that um, if they really cared about racism, they, you know, could probably look at changing their name instead of um, just tweeting a platitude. Um, and so again, this typically comes from someone who is aware of their white privilege and maybe has some guilt about it. Um, but the actions they're taking are self-serving, maybe are going to get them their own points for anti-racist work. 
um, but it's not actually doing a lot of good towards racial justice. I'm not saying the Washington Redskins are aware of their privilege and have guilt over it. Um, on an individual level, I think this is where performative allyship comes from. Um, armchair allyship. This is one that, as a teacher, I have to be very careful about. Um, my job is very intellectual, and so it's very easy to slip into this. Um, so this, usually you'll see a lot of um, defensiveness come up around the intellectual armchair ally. So this is someone who will kind of sit and debate uh, racism and kind of not connect to the fact that this is another person's lived experience. Um, and you, you might see an armchair ally play the devil's advocate in debates, um, where that side of the story is already propped up in the mainstream media and has a lot of attention and doesn't need another voice um, holding it up. And so I think of this as um, the head work of racism without being connected to the heart work, right? Without feeling how dehumanizing racism is, including for white people. Um, armchair allies, usually there's not a lot of urgency in actions. Um, there might be a willingness to let problems that are literally life and death um, for people who are oppressed by racism, um, letting those problems be solved through really slow moving bureaucracy. Um, I do wanna make a note that this does not mean that everyone always has to constantly take to the streets, but that the, um, the action should um, hopefully be still moving racial justice forward and not just kind of sitting and talking about it and signing one petition that you're not even sure who it's going to. Um, it, it also has to do with organizing meetings, right, and making food for um, people that are on the front line or um, raising bail funds or giving them rides home from the jail, you know, all of these things that can be done that um, go beyond kind of sitting and talking about the problem. And then imposter syndrome, which is one that I felt a lot when creating this presentation. Um, just kind of not even recognizing that you might have done some work around the topic so that you could show up as a leader for your community um, and help them along their journey as well. Um, and so again, this is kind of an intellectual problem, not connecting um, to the heart, getting too much in the head, and, and kind of spiraling with, well, if I do this, it's performative, and if I do this, it's an armchair allyship, and if I do this, it's this kind of problematic, and so I just am not going to try anything at all. Um, and so it's really important to recognize that, you know, all of the people when I was very young that talked to me about racism and anti-racism, I would be doing a disservice to them if I didn't take that gift that they gave me, that education that they gave me, and try to show up in opportunities like this and kind of pass it on as best as I can to others. Um, yeah. So um, getting called out for any of these. Um, I want to be clear that these are things that everyone watching this webinar, especially if you're white, is probably something that you have done or might do um, if you're showing up for movements. And that is something that I want you to get comfortable with, that you're going to say the wrong thing, you're going to say the problematic thing. Um, so some of the best advice I've gotten about how to respond to getting called out for those problematic allyships is um, to listen. You don't have to explain your intentions. Your intentions were probably very solid and good, but it's still called harm. So we'll listen to what that harm was. And then when you understand it, um, then give a sincere apology. Uh, then step back take a beat, think about if there's anything you want to try differently to not try to cause that same harm in the future, and then jump back in. This work is too important um, to just give up and not try. Uh, and if you get called out and you are holding power over the person calling out, um, it's important to think about how can you equalize that power, release it to the community. So as a teacher, I hold power in my classroom. Um, my students' grades depend on my judgment. So if several weeks into the quarter, um, they let me know that I haven't figured out how to pronounce their name right and they're feeling very um, unheard because of that, um, then I need to kind of work with them to figure out how should I be held accountable to them. Um, I used to work at a nonprofit where the youth got very upset when the, there were some staff that just kept misgendering them and of course the staff were saying, I'm not doing it on purpose, I'm just struggling with this. And so we, um, allowed the youth to lead us to come up with a system where the staff would put a quarter in the jar every time they um, misgendered somebody. And then after the jar was full, um, 
we could, you know, find an organization in Seattle um, that worked specifically on LGBTQ rights to give it to. Um, and so with my current students, um, a lot of times um, they want uh, extra participation points. So if I mess up, if I make an oops in the classroom, um, as someone that has power, um, that's one thing that I can offer, right? I can shift um, how I'm grading um, to hold myself accountable to them. Um, and the other important thing to remember about getting called out for some of these uh, harmful allyships is that, uh, well, actually, let me, I think I'll get to that in one of the next slides. Um, sorry. <laughs> and so what we're going to do now is scaffold that anti-racism stages. Um, and a lot of you might have seen this Google Doc that's going around that kind of goes through specifically for white folks the stages of identity they tend to have when it comes to racism and anti-racism. Um, and so the first one is um, colorblindness, right? So I don't see race or race is a problem that white supremacists have. I don't have, you know, racism as a problem within, I don't have any biases myself. And I had a friend that um, was saying this once and I sent her a link to the implicit bias test and she got very upset with me. <laughs> it was not the right move. So the point of scaffolding um, is that uh, if you're, if someone is in the colorblind zone, then you wanna talk to them about that topic. You wanna talk to them about the fact that even though they may feel like they're treating everyone around them equally, there is a racist system. Right, so for instance, um, the video that Maria played, um, if you are white, you probably have not talked to your kids about what to do if the cops pull you over. Versus in that video, someone pointed out that when the cops pull you over is what um, conversation might be happening in a lot of black families in the US. So these are two different experiences. So someone who's colorblind might not be ready to hear that they have bias, but if they start to hear that the system around them is unfair, they can um, connect to that and then you can hopefully have conversations at the next level. Um, the next level is called disintegration. Um, we probably hear it most often as white guilt, right? You're aware of your privilege, but you didn't ask for it and you don't know what to do about it, so you just feel really guilty. Um, and this is where that white saviorism can come up or the performative allyship can come up. Um, so it's important to sit with that guilt and not get stuck in it and try to work through it into the reintegration um, or uh, this usually is where, again, that white fragility or white defensiveness will come up. Um, and so um, this is where you'll hear people say, um, you know, again, it's not my fault, but also, oh, but I have this person of color in my family or that I'm close to, um, so I can't be racist. And the, I, the problem is that you can, and now you are close to someone, so you're more likely to cause harm. And the more you show up for movements, the more you're going to make connections and be more at risk of causing harm. Um, so it's important at this stage to move through that. Pseudo-independence is where folks are more aware of their own uh, bias and their own ways of maybe perpetuating racism. Um, and they tend to ask, what can I do? And so you'll hear this happen a lot in schools where educators of colors are put on a task force to solve racism at the school and white people don't sign up for it um, because they think, oh, this is, you know, something that I'll only say the wrong thing. So no one wants me on that task force. Um, yes, you know, the um, black indigenous people of color that are educating don't want to be alone on the task force. They would love um, some help from white folks to solve the problem of racism. Moving through that, you tend to get into immersion next, according to this Google Doc, um, where you see racism as part of systems of oppression, not individual actions. And you have embraced your own whiteness and what it means. You know how to work alongside um, people of color in organizing, and you are constantly actively working on being anti-racist. And then the last stage, um, according to this Google Doc, is autonomy, um, which is where you are really working hard to embody anti-racism and to engage in protest, step in the way of racism when you see it happen. Um, again, be very aware of your own identity and acknowledge that you might have to revisit some of these stages that just because you've reached um, autonomy at some point doesn't mean that you're not still gonna um, slip back into some of these other stages. Um, and so if you haven't seen this Google Doc um, floating around, uh, I do have a link to it in this slide that I can share in the chat for folks that are interested. What's really nice about it is that it breaks down these stages and it breaks down 
what you can read or listen to or watch at each stage to help you with whatever you might be struggling with. Um, and then you can also um, uh, figure out what actions to take next to try to push yourself um, kind of through. And they have some good advice about who, what organizations you can donate to, um, bail funds and things like that, considering this is essentially a class on how to be anti-racist that they put into a Google Doc for you to access for free. Um, and so uh, one thing I always say to my students is that a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. Right? We don't learn all of this so that we know everything about racism and we're the experts on it, but so that we can go out into movements and join in them without being a white savior or a performative ally, but being an effective and a helpful ally. And so for me, again, because of my intellectual job, it's important for me to keep thinking about heart ways to build allyship. Uh, one suggestion that has been really powerful came from the safety pin box, which um, has been discontinued, but there are other ways for folks to um, pay for, again, this kind of anti-racist curriculum. Uh, so power mapping was the first advice that the safety pin box had to give. So to think about where you have influence, um, and even the young people on this uh, webinar, you might be surprised when you sit down and actually map out who has influence in your life, and you might think of all the adults that have influence over you, but you might be surprised at where you actually have influence. Um, and then also who has power at different meetings you're in and how many of those folks are white and how many of those folks are black and indigenous or people of color, other people of color. Um, and so you can do this at school, work, religious organizations. You can do this at nonprofits. You can do this in community organizations um, and places where you shop, your bank. I know the young people um, that put this together might already be doing that with certain banks in the area. Um, you can do this at your own dining room table, right, with your friends, your household, um, your neighbors, um, kind of power mapping all of those different relationships. And then education um, is super important, both um, formal education, so reading and watching content um, to kind of further immersing yourself in the topics of racism and anti-racism. So this one webinar doesn't make any of us the expert. We all have to kind of make sure that we're continuing to read articles and um, look into the research and what are people saying about these topics. Also, I really want to emphasize again for that heart work, um, reading fiction and watching um, content when you're binging a TV show, making sure that you're exposing yourself um, to shows and to content that's outside of your own cultural experience. Um, fiction uh, stories are how we build empathy, and so that's why it's so important that we build that, not just for ourselves, but for people that don't look like us. And then the other important thing to do is to show up beyond movement moments, right? There's this kind of ordinary organizing that needs to happen um, to lay this space for times like what we're living through right now. Um, so definitely show up now, but then continue um, once this has sort of, uh, again, gone from the public's attention. And that way, you know the different organizations that are on the ground. So when something like this happens, you have those relationships built already. Um, and that just goes a really long way in helping movements be really effective. Um, so I really appreciate um, CARW, the Coalition of Anti-Racist Whites. Um, that helps me do especially the hard work of trying to be the most um, accountable ally that I can. Um, I really appreciate for the people, and um, that gives me a chance to um, show up and try to do that work um, as well. And thank you to USL and all the co-sponsors for giving me the chance to um, try to kind of put something to together today about, uh, um, yeah, all of these topics. And especially to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I feel like we're living through a really powerful moment in history, and um, it's just really exciting to see where we take it from here. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, okay, so because we are officially at 345, um, I'm going to ask all pa panelists to unmute yourselves and show your faces or mute yourselves and show your faces. Um, we're going to try to do a Q&A, but if you are not able to stay, then by all means, this is the end of our presentation. So if you have somewhere else to be, by all means leave, but we're going to be going more in depth. Um, Susan, if it's possible, can you send out um, both the link to your slides and also mm -hmm. the link to your to the document that you're talking about Absolutely. Um, in the chat to everybody? We'll do that right now. Awesome. 
Okay, and then Maria, if you could do the same thing, if you could send out the link to your slides um, to everybody, make sure it is to everybody. Um, that would be amazing because um, I know some people didn't get to see all of your slides. Okay. Awesome. I will. I sent it to um, Derek. Derek, can you post it in there for me? Awesome. Okay. And then up in the very top, um, it says Q&A. If you want to go directly through that, it'll be easier for us to get your questions because there's going to be a lot of comments coming in. Um, otherwise, if you can't find that for some reason, just put it in the chat box. Um, and Claire, possibly Derek and I, and maybe Annie will be going through your questions and trying to um, ask them along the way. Yeah, thank you, Maggie, for clarifying all of that for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question Vicki asked, which is, um, what, can you say what the consent decree decree? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the consent decree, um, so after um, John T. Williams was killed in Seattle, which I think was in 2010, um, the Department of Justice started an investigation into um, Seattle Police Department and came up with the finding that um, Seattle Police Department was um, engaging in unnecessary police brutality and excessive use of force. Um, and so there was, the consent decree is essentially what the Department of Justice told um, SPD they had to do to be in compliance um, because of all the mistakes that they had made leading up to the investigation. So one part of that what led to body cams that for some reason they've been turning off during the protest this last week. Um, I don't understand legally how that's been allowed. Um, so I'm trying to do some research into that. Um, the other uh, thing that came out of that was the um, it, it's the it's the CPC, I forget what it stands for, but it's essentially a community police commission. So it's community members that kind of review um, the police and I, I believe they're elected um, by the voters. And then uh, at the time that the investigation was happening, um, you know, there was, uh, I was working for a center. Um, we had to make a 911 call um, because a student had cut themselves with a knife and uh, the police showed up and every single decision they made, they had to call their supervisor because of the investigation, um, because of the, the findings of the investigation of the brutality um, and the excessive use of force. Um, so I don't think they have to call their supervisor as often, um, but they are still supposed to have body cams um, and they are still um, accountable to the, um, the CPC, the Community Police Commission, I believe is what the letters stand for. So the city right before um, the protest started, um, I believe before, you know, maybe like two weeks ago, the city um, attorney had, had uh, asked the Department of Justice to rescind the consent decree, basically saying, um, we've done it, we've arrived, Seattle Police Department is no longer a brutal force. And so after the protest, people started demanding, please rescind that, we still need that consent decree. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, let's see. Um, there are a few questions in the q and I have three so far, so four so far. Um, we have one that speaks to a specific statement. So um, Maria and Susan, if you can go into the Q&A and look at that directly and mm -hmm. answer that, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, One's about a specific article. So Gary, um, we might need to review it a little bit more before we can give input on it. Yeah, I'd love to hear what Maria has to say to Aubrey's statement. Um, if you think about that Google Doc scaffolding, it sounds like this person is definitely still in colorblindness. Um, they maybe don't have a lot of awareness around um, uh, systemic racism or their own way of perpetuating racism um, and so if this is someone that you feel comfortable engaging with um, if you think you can have a positive influence on them um, things like unpacking the invisible knapsack by Maggie by, by Peggy McIntosh um, help kind of break down 
the fact that there are two different experiences, I mean, more than two, but if we're talking about race and we're talking about black versus white with someone that has this opinion, we want them to at least start acknowledging that there are two different experiences when white versus black people talk to the police. Um, so that could be one place to start. Yeah, thank you for Susan for saying that. I was actually looking for the questions. I am, I am missing the mark on technology today. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but also, I think we have to look at how the percentages are put together and just look at methodology because methodology plays a big part with this. I would suggest to talk to anyone who talks, who's looking at these percentages to understand that maybe they need to do some reading about who collected the number, how did they do the methodology. Yes. Um, because that's a narrative in itself. You, as a researcher, you can set it up to look a certain way if you really want it to. It's not considered ethical, mm -hmm. but, but that is how things are many, many times are done with percentages. So, um, so looking at the source, back to Susan's point of looking at um, the who's saying what, you know, that's the always thing is what do they get out of it for saying that? Um, but looking at the source and look how the research was done and uh, I think that will help clarify some misinformation that is out there um, about black on black crime. Mm -hmm. um, can I just jump in really fast on that one too? That's exactly the kind of post or that that kind of comment is super triggering for me mm -hmm. as a person of color when people are basically like throwing data out there or, or like making me justify um, something or have to do research, which is just like adding extra labor onto what already is challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, if, if you, um, if someone posts that on your own social media as a comment, um, you know, you definitely want to let them know that that's harming people in your community, like Derek just expressed. Um, some people say don't delete it so that their actions are public and known sometimes I think it's good to delete it if it's just causing a lot of harm and triggering a lot of people and this isn't someone that's, you know, trying to engage um, and learn. So it's kind of up to your relationship to figure out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, alrighty. I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, so Summer asked about uh, suggestions on how to address white people wanting to broadcast police officers of color as victims uh, as a way to just uh, decentralize these mm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to address that one, Maria? Which, I'm sorry, which one are we reading? The uh, top one by Summer Joe. Yeah, it should be the second one now. Oh, I was the second one. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I was looking at curriculum. Ah, they're moving too fast. <laughs> um, so okay so suggestions on how to address white people wanting to broadcast police officers of color as victims as a way to see so i guess i want to make sure i understand the question so the broadcast police officers as color um as victims so showing them as being part of the oppressed system is that what i'm clarifying yeah, so like if there's a police, it sounds to me like if there's a um, police officer of color, um, they're, uh, they're a victim of these protests or they're a victim of, um, yeah, you know, they're a, vict they're a victim of racism and therefore the protests are making them a victim, I believe. Oh, okay. Because I think there's a duality here. I think that one, you could be... Um, I think to acknowledge as a person of color that if you are part of an overall system that has created such systemic racism, um, how do you hold that duality and still work for that system? Mm. And I think that happens many times. How do you work for a system that you know has colonized so many people within that system, but still you work underneath the business of that system? And I think many people can relate to that actually. So it's this weird place of um, duality of holding both of those truths and so I think that if there is going to be those who are videotaping um, uh, black police being involved in the protests and they, I think there is complexity for many uh, black police right now of holding both of those truths of trying to serve and protect, which um, in, in communities of color, a lot of times you want the officers to be somebody within your community 
because that actually shows that you have people with right. trying to serve and protect those in community. Um, so, so, but then at the same time, they're not immune to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I, I think that if people, I'm not sure about the, the camera piece or the video or acknowledging it on social media, mm. um, as long as the right dialogues are happening with what's being posted. Because if you don't understand the complexity or the narrative of it, then I think it can maybe even simplify or minimize the experiences in which they might be having um, during those times. Mm -hmm. So one, um, one uh, way that you could um, approach this person is like how I broke down education and the way that education um, is a colonizing force. And I love education as a teacher. It's my calling is to be a teacher. And I still know that there's a lot within the system within um, that I teach in um, that's very um, problematic and has caused a lot of harm. And so if you can admit that about whatever system that you are a part of, um, that you are benefiting from, um, that can help others kind of take down that defensiveness and understand that um, just because there are officers of color doesn't mean that the system of policing isn't um, inherently racist because of the history of it and because of the um, white supremacy in our country currently. And then I, um, I'm not sure if I've read the exact article that Gary has, but there are a lot of good resources floating around um, social media because I think a lot of white folks are wanting to show up as allies and are getting a little bit like kind of stuck in the headlights. Um, so um, if, if uh, so Gary, I, um, I'm trying to copy and paste the link, but I can't, it won't let me co copy and paste in the Q&A box, but um, I'll, I'll Google the title later, but I, and, you know, I encourage all of us to continue doing our research on what are people saying are effective ways of showing up. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple questions from teachers. Um, one, uh, I think to you, Susan, about your curriculum, um, mm -hmm. and then another about um, talking to middle schoolers um, mm -hmm. and how they can help in this um, crisis right now. Yeah, um, I would recommend um, those of you working with middle schoolers to check out um, teachingtolerance.org. If you haven't already, you probably have. <laughs> but it a, a, a came out of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and they have a lot of ideas about um, talking to very young kids about race and about helping them plan, um, like, kind of not, not um, exactly project-based learning, but kind of getting a little bit closer to that. Um, so helping them think about um, what are ways that they can engage? Um, can you have a class um, Twitter account that they help compose tweets on? They probably, at that age, they might not be able to have their own social media. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of creative ideas. Can they organize a bake sale to raise money to bail out um, uh, protesters? I know it's all so much harder in the age of distance learning too. So, you know, my sympathies, <laughs> yeah. Um. And then as far as your curriculum directly, mm -hmm. um, where do you get that from? Or where, what do you use as inspiration? Yeah, um, I do use some curriculum from Teaching Tolerance. Um, and then my uh, parents actually got me a book called um, Putting the Movement Back into Civil Rights Teaching. And so I try to find curriculum like that for whatever topic I'm teaching that um, is going to look through um, a much more systemic lens at any system of oppression. Um, I also have my master's in curriculum and instruction. So I create a lot of my curriculum and kind of piecemeal it from a lot of different resources. Uh, and I teach at a re-engagement program, so I'm not teaching in the public schools. Um, I think there's a lot of teachers in the public schools, especially in Seattle right now, fighting for um, ethnic studies curriculum, um, fighting for some pretty radical curriculum in the schools. So. Um, Seattle Education Association uh, is their um, union that will publish a lot about that, so you can follow them to kind of support them in that fight. Great. Um, I want to jump to one question that was not posted in the Q&A, um, but just go maybe if you guys have resources that you go to to find um, local information on mm. these issues and just how you keep up with current events, maybe going over that a little bit so that people know like what to look to for reliable information. 
Um, Maria, would you like to take this since I went over a little bit of that in my presentation? You haven't had the chance to share it though. No, no, it's fine. You've had great stuff, actually. I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> So for me, I, I look at resources, especially from more within the communities, uh, communities of color. I think it's important to see how they're telling their story, their news, their narrative. Um, so it's looking at nonprofits, probably some of the earlier ones, I think, Susan, you mentioned, um, and looking at to see what they're saying, looking at um, what they have up on their websites as well, and attending to those webinars. And, and for me, looking at exposure from different voices in this so we can really look at all the different narratives that are going on and not just rely on white stream media because um, mm -hmm. that's a particular narrative we need to be thoughtful about especially on how uh, when I was watching the news on Saturday I was even kind of taken back by the reporters and the way they were reporting the story and I just didn't think it really provided and honored um, what was going on and um, and I can go on about that but so I think this is a great question. And, and really, I think if you want to learn more about the narratives of the communities that are being impacted is to read their news stories, to read their, um, their newsletters. And um, uh, there's, I can't think of like off the top of my head what they're <laughs> called, because I'm afraid I'm going to give the wrong website or the title. <laughs> but I'll be happy to uh, send some as resources, because I think that's really it, there's something about really truly reading the story within a community as opposed mm -hmm. to having it told to a community. So I, I think intentionality around that. And um, it does take time to find out where those, some of those are at and not all of them. I, I'm not on Twitter and I'm not on Instagram and I'm not <laughs> on a, a bunch of this stuff. So I think I'm probably missing some even um, great stuff that are out there that are on a lot of these social media platforms. For the, the youth on here, are there any, um, like Maria's hinting at, are there any social media platforms that we might not be aware of that you want to lift up? Or any, anyone we should be following on those platforms? Um, I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm not really sure. We, I mean, I just tend to watch the news daily now with everything that's going on, which right. can be a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't want to do that, you know, it's very understandable, but, uh, you know, just there's a lot of reliable news sources out there. You just kind of have to weed through and um, make sure that you're fact checking everything. If there's a specific, um, if there's a specific topic that you really want to look into, um, always just making sure that like how up to date it is or who the publisher is or mm -hmm. who's writing it because if you're if you're looking up articles about how you can help or um or be an ally to a movement you want to read articles by people who are on the front lines finding fighting this injustice rather mm -hmm. than people who have been sitting back and watching um so yeah just i don't really have a very clear answer as well um but just make that's a good sense. analysis though yeah thanks yeah um that's that's what I recommend doing. Um, yeah. Yep. I don't have a specific place where I get my info uh, either, but like Annie said, just checking your resources, um, and like both of you said, um, making sure that you go back to the source. Um, it's just it, lots of practice and lots of digging. <laughs> Derek, mm. go ahead. Yeah, uh, Maria. It sounds like you have to run. Um, I do have a four o'clock. I'm so thank sorry. Thank you so much for jumping on. Really. Yeah, thank, thank you all for having me. And, and I, like I said at the very beginning, I'm so excited to see the generations um, before us and after really continue with uh, liberation work. Mm -hmm. and, and I just got to come in. Like, I just think it's amazing that uh, even at your age to be so thoughtful and intentional about your actions. Uh, I just want to say it's, it was an honor to be here. So thank you so much. It gives me hope. I appreciate the allyship and let's keep, keep doing the good fight. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Um, I know that a lot of people are logging off right now, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to all of our high school teachers who are on. Oh, um, yeah. I appreciate all of you. And I see my AP biology teacher, my English teacher, my Spanish teacher, 
and um, my science teacher from seventh grade. So wow. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. And um, I know that there's probably a few more questions to answer, but I just wanted to get that out there in case people. Yeah, can. and folks are sharing some great uh, recommendations in the chat of who to follow as well. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to send out any uh, recommendations as far as books or other resources. Um, we did have another question um, at the top of the list, Susan, if you want to um, talk to that, and um, in the middle, one directly to you. Yeah, the one at the top, white people try and use police officers of color stories to show blue lives matter, and that includes black indigenous people of color cops to aid social media presence, positions of white people being anti-protest. Um, yeah, kind of similar to one of the questions that we um, asked before, or that was uh, asked before, is um, essentially if someone is um, sharing a lot of that information, they might not be seeing the problem as systemic. They're focusing on particular people within the system and how their identity um, creates um, a complicated space for them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I would definitely say um, check out that scaffolding document and think about um, where is this person at and um, what can you say to them to help expand their view of this as a systemic issue. Um, and the reason the scaffolding document is so helpful is because when a lot of people are showing up in a movement moment like this, um, you'll hear a lot of um, people, especially if, again, if someone is an organizer who is living as the recipient of oppression of racism, it gets very exhausting to take on the education. And so if you are showing up in this space as a white ally, one thing you can do is use that scaffolding document to say, okay, someone's way back here in that colorblind category. I can talk to them about, let's talk about systemic privileges that we have that people of color don't have. And then you can start addressing um, some of the further issues. So all of this stuff where, where people are saying, well, but there's you know, black police officers or there's you know, A, B, and C, they're in that colorblind zone. They're not seeing the systemic issues. So that's exactly where you can start with them. And then the last question that I see, um, do teachers receive formal training in the nature of systemic racism? There's not um, like a federal policy of teachers um, that get that formal training. I think a lot of really good education schools are digging into that, but this is not, this really depends on where you get your um, teaching certificate or where you go to school to be a teacher. Um, that is going to really vary the type of training that you get. Um, so for instance, I wasn't exposed to a whole bunch of um, resources about decolonizing education, even if I was getting trained on systemic racism. Um, and so that's a lot of stuff that I've had to um, research um, on my own or learn from other organizers or other teachers that I worked with. Um, so it really depends on where the teacher is, what kind of training they're getting, and know as a whole, teachers across the country are not getting a lot of training and help understanding systemic racism, which does make it really hard for them <laughs> to then teach it to their students. Yeah. Thank you for addressing that. Alrighty, so I do not see any more questions. If you have one, please shout out. If not, I think we're going to start closing up soon. I know I have other places to be, but thank you so much um, for being here, and thank you so much for doing this, Susan, and um, mm -hmm. I know Maria already left, but I'm so appreciative to her as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's see. Um, I got a couple in the chat, but oh yes, so um, the recording uh, and a couple of the slideshows and everything like that, I want to send that out in an email to everybody who was able to participate here, just so that they can get like all the resources in one place. Um, so in order to do that, I think we're gonna have to copy the chat and then go through that on our own. Um, but I think sending out those resources would be amazing and a great opportunity for everybody who is here and who is interested. So we can do that. It might take a couple days, <laughs> but yes. So yeah.